Welcome to In The Funnel. My name is Mark Cox. In The Funnel is a group of sales coaches and consultants that help B2B sales teams dramatically improve revenue. Clients come to us when revenue growth is stagnated, or their sales team is not meeting expectations, or they need to recalibrate their sales and go-to-market plan for the upcoming year. Our clients have enjoyed tremendous success working within the funnel. And please, hear it straight from them by listening to the testimonial section of this website. What they'll tell you is there's two things that make us unique and different in our space. Number one, we have a process and a methodology. First, for understanding your current state. And then second, for building your sales and go-to-market plan for the upcoming year. The second thing that makes us unique and different is that everybody within the funnel has run a material sales organization in their recent past. We're all practitioners. We don't have any theorists or teachers. And what that means is we can get in front of your sales team and run the next sales meeting or join them on their next sales call to close your next large prospect. All of us have a passion for professional discipline, process-driven sales, and we'd be delighted to talk to you if you're looking to grow revenue for your company. Please feel free to reach out to us through this website at info at inthefunnel.com or by telephone. Thanks for taking the time to watch this. If you're telling a story, you can't be the hero. You need to think of yourself like Yoda in Star Wars or Ashoka, <laughs> helping somebody climb Mount Everest. And when that happens, you tug at heartstrings and people open the purse strings because they've seen themselves in the story. Team, that was John Levesay. And John is actually known as the Pitch Whisperer. He's a great keynote speaker. He's also a fantastic author. And he's written a couple of books that I really like. Better Selling Through Storytelling, the Essential Roadmap to Becoming a Revenue Rockstar, and his latest book, The Sale is in the Tale. John also hosts the Successful Pitch Podcast with listeners in over 60 countries. He's even been on TV on Larry King Live as an expert on how to ask for what you want and get a yes. Today's conversation between John and I, we really talk about storytelling and sales and how it's so difficult these days to stand out and what you need to do to apply a simple framework to tell a more compelling story that's gonna make you and your business more magnetic and memorable to your buyers. I like his framework of turning a case study into a case story so that it stands out. Um, one of the other things that you're gonna get when you chat with John is he's focused on helping salespeople actually improve their self-esteem. We've got that roller coaster of, hey, I knocked the ball out of the park and now I'm having a tough time. And John's approach, very empathetic about putting the wind in the sails of salespeople. I'd encourage you to check out his TED Talk also, which is called Be the Lifeguard of Your Own Life. A very, very popular TED Talk. But right now we're gonna enjoy our conversation with John Livesey, the Pitch Whisperer. Hey, John, welcome to the show, and thank you so much for joining. Mark, what a pleasure and an honor to be with you. Well, well, the pleasure is all mine, John. I've really enjoyed your TED Talk. We're going we're gonna to talk about that a little bit today. Um, I'm so keen on this topic of storytelling and sales. So, mm -hmm. so better, story, better selling through storytelling. In your latest book, of course, The Sale is in the Tale. I love that. Thanks. But, but when I start to think of things, John, I mean, really, I was introduced to PowerPoint literally 30 years ago, where a forward thinking company gave all of us laptops in about 94. Mm -hmm. And they gave us training on all of the earliest Microsoft suite of services, which was amazing back then, yes. including PowerPoint. And I start to think of how many pitches and presentations and everything I've been through in 30 years, it's staggering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, I just everything you talk about in terms of the storytelling resonates so much for me. So I, I think our team here is really going to get a lot out of today's conversation. Mm. But first, 
maybe you could give us a little bit about your journey in professional sales, because it, I know it's an interesting one from the TED Talk. <laughs> well, I majored in advertising. I was completely mesmerized by what motivated people to remember a jingle or change oh, brands yeah. or any of that stuff. And um, that really um, gave me my storytelling skill sets because an ad has to grab your attention with a good headline, right. just like a story does. And um, But instead of going and working for an ad agency right away, I actually end up being in Silicon Valley and working in tech. Ah, sales. And I realized there's a lot of emotions that would go on when I was competing against IBM, where they'd say, you know, if it breaks, we're going to point the finger at the other vendor, even if that vendor's machine is less expensive and faster, you're good fired for buying something that's not IBM. It was called FUD back in the day, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. I remember that. And so my advertising background, oh, there's some psychological, emotional reasons here. It's not just uh, logic. And so I went, that was great sales training. And then I got uh, transferred down to Southern California and um, ended up working for an ad agency, creating commercials for movies coming out on home video. Oh, cool. And we could take a movie that hadn't done so well theatrically and reposition it for people to get to watch it on home video or rent or buy it. And that really was fascinating to see the same movie repositioned, telling a different story. And, and then from there, I went on and had a 15-year sales career selling media for Condé Nast, which is mm. GQ and Wired and Vanity Fair, Arc Digest, Vogue, it's, it's 23 different brands. And um, Lexus would, was one of the uh, accounts I called on. And they said, you know, we looked at 15 magazines. We've narrowed it down to 10. We're going to pick three. And so each of you get to come in, the 10 of you, for half an hour and media day back to back to back and tell us your idea. Do not come in and talk about numbers. We've so hard to, so yeah. hard to stand out. So yeah. hard to stand out. And half the reps were deer in headlights. Don't talk about the circulation or the income of the readers. What am I going to talk about? Um, and I realized, oh, it's the story that's going to make you what your marketing idea and bringing it to life and why the editors have a certain voice and a tone that appeals to the psychographics of why this particular car buyer would want that. So um, that really um, honed my sales career at Condé Nast. 2008 came along. I got laid off and the mortgage crisis hit and advertising was plummeting. Had to reinvent myself and sit, learn mm -hmm. how to sell digital ads. And that was a tough, oh, and so, but someone said one thing to me, Mark, that really helped. He said, you know, this reminds me of what happened to silent movie stars. Some made it to talkies and some didn't. Mm. And so all of us have that, you know, whether it's blockchain or NFT, there's constantly new technology and things to learn. And we all have to decide, am I going to be stuck? And that's where my learning stops or am I going to continue? So I learned how to sell digital ads. And then two years after being laid off, I got rehired. And part of the reason I got rehired was I left on a good note. Mm. Good learning uh, there know, too. The lifeguard training I'd had about not panicking and staying calm during stressful situations, because that's certainly a stressful situation. You feel like, you know, the, somebody kicked you in the gut. Um, and I went, wait, I've lost my job, not my identity. And I said, don't you need a status report? And they said, well, that'd be great. But everybody else is so angry. They're storming out. And because of that one decision, little did I know that two years later, I'd get rehired because then they had a new editor and a website and the print to sell together. And I ended up coming back and I said, I'm not coming back with any fear because oh. I'd always had all this fear of not making my quota, the magazine going out of business, whatever. And I said, like, I've already experienced all of that and I'm fine. And then I learned the big lesson. You can't have fear and creativity at the same time. Oh boy. How about one crowds out the other? Exactly. And so because I was, was not coming back with any Fear, I had more creative ideas than I ever had. Ended up doing a joint venture with Guest Jeans that allowed me to win Salesperson of the Year against 400 other salespeople around the world. And Mark, as I was standing there holding that award, I thought, I'm the same person that got laid off two years ago. And then that's become my mission now the last 10 years, helping other salespeople get off what I call the self-esteem roller coaster, where we only feel good if our numbers are up and bad if they're down. And then mm. we get to the place where we're not at the effect of any one event impacting our self-esteem. 
Boy, oh boy. So, so, so many great things to talk about there, John, but this helping salespeople with self-esteem, mm. um, everything you just talked about really resonates with me. And I, I'll be honest, I don't think anybody on the podcast has heard this, but you know, about 10 years ago in my career, I had a similar situation where part of a large corporate entity mm -hmm. kind of on, on the path to taking the most senior job, if not one of the most senior jobs, and within the course of about a year with some ownership change in strategy, it's all over. Yep. Mm -hmm. And and so frankly, you know, we have wonderful life, you know, married, wonderful, uh, love Donna, I've been married for 22 years, we have no kids. So much of my life had been tied up in my professional identity. I became completely lost. And, you know, everybody around me said, this is a gift and enjoy mm -hmm. your time off and you know, you'll find another role in about a year, et cetera, et cetera, all this kind of stuff. And I just couldn't enjoy a single day of it. I uh -huh. felt like my, my, my complete identity had been taken yes. and it was such a, it, it was such an interesting journey that actually led to the creation of this organization in the funnel, uh -huh. which we've been doing for 10 years, which is the, you know, the joy of my life. However, the perspective on everything is completely different. Mm -hmm. You know, corporate world, you do live in a lot of fear and positioning. As an entrepreneur, all you're caring about is helping other organizations and driving a result. Right. But boy, that journey can be tough to, to go through in this idea that where you're helping salespeople live better lives through uh, helping with the self-esteem is so important. In fact, Liz Wiseman's recent book uh, called um, Impact Players speaks of this same concept. Mm -hmm. I forget the two terms. I'm going to have to think. I'll think of it later for sure. But John, let's let's circle through here because today's topic. You're an expert on storytelling. Yes, and I think this is so critically important today. It's so common for us. We get brought in. We're working with large, let's say, tech company or manufacturing business, and as you say. They've got the pitch and, and it's the motor memory on working with a sales team that starts their preparation for the pitch by just building PowerPoint slides is staggering. Oh, yes. Instead of this taking this step back. So, so tell me about how we can use storytelling to make more of an impact in those, those beauty contests, how mm -hmm. we stand out. Well, I recently worked with an architecture firm and they were told, you're in the final three. Mm. All three of you could do the work. So we're going to pick the firm we like the most because mm. we have to work with you for six years. They got me on the phone so fast. They said, we don't even know where to start with that. <laughs> we just hope our designs are good enough to win this, the business. And I said, well, it all starts with the team slide, which almost everybody has. If you pick us, here's who you work with. And they had said, well, we might even skip that slide if we run out of time. And I'm like, no, 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 no. It's the most important slide right. because people buy your energy. People buy emotionally and then back it up with logic. And so instead of the traditional boring, I've been here 10 years, this is what I do. I pull out little story of origins of each of them. Yeah. One guy said, oh, I was um, 11 playing with Legos. That's what got me into architecture. Now I have a son that's 11. I still play with him. Mm. Uh, I said, what about you, Sue? Where did you work before here? She goes, oh, I uh, was in the uh, Israeli army. I said, okay, I bet you learned about focus and discipline. And since you're the person in charge of making sure this thing comes on time and on budget, you got the perfect background. So pulling those little story of origins out on the team slide makes all the difference in the world of being memorable. Because here's the big problem that storytelling solves. The clients hear you all three pitches, then they have a second meeting, the meeting after the meeting, I call it. Mm -hmm. You go, well, we heard all the pitches. What do you think? They all sound the same. I guess we should go the cheapest. Right. If your team has told a story about yourselves and other clients that you've helped, as opposed to just the boring traditional case studies, I turn them into case stories. Then they can remember your story and repeat it at the meeting after the meeting and say, you know, I really want to work with this company. That story they told me about themselves. I think they get us better than the other team. There's some chemistry here. They seem to have chemistry. So there's a lot to unpack in that, but that's just the tip of the iceberg of how storytelling can help people win when they're up against competitors, starting with the story of origin. And then you and I talked before the show about Robert Caldali's uh, persuasion book, where he teaches people to edify each other. 
So I, I layer that on. I said, imagine that you're in a relay race and you're handing the baton off to the next person. So before that person even opens their mouth, you know, uh, there's nobody better than Mark Cox at Funnels. And then you open your mouth in that team presentation. And then you do the same thing to the next person with your personal story. Boom. That's a memorable team. And just so you remember, John, the next time we do this, you're also going to want to bring up that I'm a fantastic goalie. There's nobody better than Mark Cox at stopping pucks going north of 75 miles an hour. I just so you know. It. The Canadian so, thing is yeah, very can, of course, well. Of course. That's the only thing we care about. <laughs> so so such an important point. Um, by the way, folks, just, just so everybody knows, you'll want to check out John's podcasts. He's, he's had some of the best guests that I've listened to on podcast, including, and I always get the pronunciation of his name wrong. I guess it's, is it Robert Cialdini? It is. Yes. The, I mispronounced it. You just said it right. Yes. Yeah. The, I always mess it up. The author of Influence and then Persuasion. Mm -hmm. Influence is one of the top 10 books, I think, in business I've ever read. Yes. So, so I just think it's, it's absolutely spectacular as is your podcast with him. Thank you. But, but let's talk about that game because, you know, um, you know, John, you mentioned, hey, after these presentations, the, the buying group goes in a room and they go, it's so hard to differentiate. So let's go back to price. So that's, mm -hmm. hey, we can't communicate a value proposition. We're not connecting emotionally. Right. It's so common. What you speak of so frequently, and I think is a real challenge is, it's because those presentations often talk about how great is Mark Cox and in the funnel and nobody cares. Right. The problem is the story. If I get up there and the story is, why is my company so great? They mm -hmm. don't care about me or my company. They care about themselves and their company. Yes. They have to be the hero of the story. So glad you said that. That is the essence of the secret. If you're telling a story, you can't be the hero. You need to think of yourself like Yoda in Star Wars or Sherpa, <laughs> helping somebody climb Mount Everest. And when that happens, you tug at heartstrings and people open the purse strings because they've seen themselves in the story. Let's give everybody a quick example of what we mean by that. Please. Working with a healthcare tech company, they said, you know, we've got this equipment. It makes the surgeries go 30% faster. We don't know why doctors aren't just instantly buying this. It's so logical. And I said, well, the first problem is it's people don't buy logically, even if it's an expensive piece of medical equipment. So I asked them a series of questions, and now they tell this short case story. Imagine how happy Dr. Higgins was six months ago down at Long Beach Memorial using this equipment. They could go out to the patient's family in the waiting room an hour earlier than expected. Mm. And if you've ever waited for someone you love to come out of surgery, you know every minute feels like an hour. He came out, put them out of their waiting misery and said, good news, the scope shows they don't have cancer, they're going to be fine. And then turned to the rep and said, you know, this is why I became a doctor for moments like this. Now that rep tells that case story to another doctor at another hospital who sees himself in the story and says, you know what? That's why I became a doctor. I want your equipment. Completely different. You see all the techniques that are in there that the doctor's the hero, the equipment is what made the doctor look like a hero. The client said to me, that gives us chills. Not only are we not telling a story, it never occurred to us to make a patient's family a character in the story. So that's really my skill is helping people figure out what story to tell that people go, oh, it's not just the doctor and the patient that are being impacted by this ending an hour earlier, there's someone else. And I pull you in a little bit by saying, if you've ever waited for someone you love. Mm which of course, unfortunately, all of us have. Yes. And if you haven't, you're too young or whatever, you can imagine it. <clears throat> so that's the some of the techniques that are pulling people in there. And, and so, John, if we were preparing with, with one of our wonderful clients today for, for an important presentation, mm -hmm. and, and you know, let's pick a technology company and they sell into to large financial institutions as every technology company yes. does, those big financial institutions today, there is no one person who makes a decision anymore. It's a few people, never was really. Right. <laughs> you know, there's six, seven, 10 people involved. They've all got different needs and wants. How best do we prepare 
using your storytelling framework and the four key elements of a good story, how do we prepare to really stand out? Talk us through how we would yes. do that for the next meeting two days from now. Sure. The first part is to realize that your brain should be like a jukebox or a playlist. Instead of different songs coming out, different stories come out. You can't say that, tell the same story over and over again. It has to be a customized story. Mm. So if you're calling on a financial institution with a group, ideally you have another example of making that kind of a sale. Yes. So they will say, oh, that doctor sounds like me. That institution sounds like us. Um, <clears throat> and the four steps are the exposition. You must paint the picture, the who, what, where, when, so someone knows where they are in the story. And they'll get case of the equipment there, you know, Dr. Higgins' name, you know what hospital it is, how long ago it was. All those details must open your story. Then the second part is the problem. And as you know, Mark, the better you can describe someone's problem, the more likely they think you have their solution. And the, in a story, the problem, the stakes have to be kind of high mm. for us to care about what's going on in the story. So in that case, every minute feels like an hour. Um, the solution is, in that case, the doctor comes out and says, good news. And the secret sauce to every good story that very few have is the resolution. What is life like after that's been solved? Imagine if the Wizard of Oz ended when Dorothy got in the balloon to go back to <laughs> the end. But the, no, there's that wonderful scene where she's like, and you were there and I, uh, you know, all this appreciation for love and life and family. That resolution is what makes, and in this case that I just gave, it's, this is why I became a doctor and that dialogue. So another tip, when you're telling a story, tell the dialogue in present tense. Mm. Don't say- so the doctor told me this is why he became a doctor. No, the doctor said, this is why I became a doctor for moments like this. Yeah. Very different than past tense. So if I was in your scenario that you painted that picture, so let's assume that I have sold to a big financial institution with multiple decision makers, I would follow those same steps. I would say how long ago it was, maybe you can or cannot use the name. Even if you can't use the name, you can describe you know, they go, oh, that sounds like us. That's about our size. Where is it in the country or the world? And then um, describe their problem in such a way that mm, the people listening to that go, God, that sounds a lot like what we're struggling with. We have different needs. We've got, we're under the gun. Our CEO is pressuring us. Our stock price is down. Whatever's going on, right? That causes them to even want to change. Um, and then you tell your solution and then you must have a resolution that what they realized was not only did they make the right decision going with us, but they actually got closer together as a team working on making this decision. And a year later, they told us, man, this was just the start of many team uh, decisions we made as a team because we had, we were so happy with the decision we made to hire you that now um, we have a, a whole nother level of trust for future decisions. We have to work together, um, those kinds of things. Oh, that's great. So the exposition, the problem, the solution, the resolution, mm -hmm. also kind of the story arc of almost every movie we've ever seen. Yes. You know, including you used uh, Yoda, including the every version of the Star Wars tril trilogies. Right. So Wizard of Oz, all of them. Yeah. Everything's the same. Um, tell me a little bit about when we're when we're into these cell cycles, John. You know, first of all, depending upon your target market. Mm -hmm. So, for one client that sells into financial institutions, financial institutions based on the country of origin are remarkably similar. <laughs> so, so let's pick. I'll pick one we know: Canada regulated industry. Yes, kind of five real banks, maybe six. They're mm -hmm. all exactly the same. So, so, and all of those buying personas, almost exactly the same. And so I guess there's almost a version of this story yes. that it applies to each member of that buying, each buying persona within the team. Mm -hmm. You know, the head of operations is going to feel one way, the head of IT feel another way, the head of the business yep. feels completely different. You know, so, so having a little bit of a story that resonates with each buying persona, I think is really important. And then, um, Tell me a little bit more about some of the challenges that you're seeing when you're working mm. with teams today, when right. they try and apply what appears to be a very logical, simple framework 
Mm. Where do they where do they get tripped up? And what suggestions do we have for them? Well, I actually have two Canadian examples. All right, fantastic. <laughs> um, MCAP, which is a mortgage company, <clears throat> yep, in Canada, yep. and they had me as their sales keynote speaker talking to the sales team about how to not drown in a sea of sameness against all the other mortgage people. Right, that's good. Yeah, right? the interest rates are what they are. It's the same. So, what's the story that makes us right. stand out? And we started crafting stories of how they help real estate agents with their business so that they want to keep referring people to them. So going above and beyond just making it transactional and telling that story. Uh, recently, Bosch and Loam out of Canada had me mm. come speak to their sales team calling on optometrists. And, um, you know, optometrists are competing with, you know, big stores online. You know, why should you buy the contacts from the doctor? Right. So... Um, I interviewed one of the optometrists and he said, listen, so many salespeople come in, they say the same thing. Our company's the best, our product's the best. And here's some research because I can do the research. And so, but if the rep comes in and says, you know, I um, helped this doctor increase his store traffic or the doctor was looking for another staff member, but my territory is so large in Canada that I actually knew somebody who was moving and was looking for a job. So those relationships of why you want to work with Bosch and Loam um, are the stories that make doctors want to sit up and listen and have a conversation with you and not just so fact oriented. So those are examples. The whole thing is everyone on some level is drowning in a sea of sameness. Whether yes. you're a speaker, a sales trainer, a lawyer, an architect, mortgage broker, you name it. And so it's the stories that help you not feel like you're drowning in that sea of sameness because it makes you memorable and people can repeat the stories. I have three little tips I think will help everybody as when you're telling Please. a story, here's your checklist. Is it clear? If it's not clear, we know the confused mind says no and they're not gonna tell you you're confused. Is it concise? It needs to be concise so they can remember and repeat it at that second meeting after the meeting. And finally, is it compelling? Does it tug at the heartstrings because people buy emotionally and then back it up with logic? So they're clear, concise, and compelling. When you're working on a story, have that as your checklist. Tell your story to some of your coworkers and say, ask them all three questions. Was it clear? Was it concise? Do you think you could remember that and repeat it? Was it at all compelling? Uh, so simple and powerful, but uh, required. Mm -hmm. I mean, those of us, I, you know, I'm listed as the CEO of this company. I make very few of the most important decisions, truthfully. But mm -hmm. so I get, I get cold called all the time. I get people reaching out all the time. It's never about us. It's always about them mm -hmm. and their solution. It doesn't resonate. And if we do go down the path of having a second or third or fourth discussion with someone, rarely is there that connection. And if there is this type of connection where they tell the story and there's the emotional connection, the decision is over. Mm. Then I'm going to, I'm going to find some reason to back up my emotional decision to want to work with them. Exactly. Truthfully, that's how we end up hiring people as well. None of us know that, oh, nice. but it's just, it's just so quick. Your decision, whether or not you like someone is so mm. it, it's automatic. It yes. happens subconsciously. And then your brain goes to try and find evidence to back up that initial opinion. You know what that reminds me of, Mark, is someone said, the most important decision you make, Einstein, I think it's a quote from, is whether you think the world is a safe, friendly place or not. Mm. And based on that belief, you tend to go around, as you said, looking for evidence to support it. Am I going to like visiting Canada? Everyone's really friendly there. Everyone, yeah, that's your belief, right? If you think Canadians are not friendly, then you'll look for people who aren't friendly. Um, right. Let's give people a little secret question in case there's some people listening or watching that are ha having an interview come up. And at the end of the interview, you're always going to get asked, any questions for us? We've asked you a ton of questions. Unfortunately, some young people will say, yes, when does my vacation start? That's not <laughs> the way. <laughs> nice. Um, instead say, what would it look like if I were to exceed your expectations in this job? Yeah, great. I had somebody hired on the spot from that one question because they were already leaning towards them, but that question showed 
there's someone who goes above and beyond as opposed to saying it, which although I'm a hard worker, you know, but instead your future pacing somebody already imagining you in the job combined with showing it instead of telling it by that one question. Think, you know, you build on that, John, for folks listening here today. I think, by the way, we'd hire the person on the spot as well. What a great question. Mm -hmm. And think of it as when I'm telling the story, mm -hmm. you know, as part of that beauty pageant, whatever you'd like to call it. If one of my final questions was, hey, listen, John, as part of our process, we're looking in, we're looking to co-create value with this mm -hmm. after the initial engagement. That means we're not just trying to sell you more services. We're actually yeah. looking to help you run a better business. Mm -hmm. And on a quarterly basis, we're going to sit down and assess the performance of your business yep. so we can figure out how we're actually helping you do that. I'm wondering what three or four most important metrics for us to review mm. in that health check meeting on an ongoing basis. So, so that might be a question, maybe you tell me, but it would get yes. them saying, hey, this, this company wants yep. to help us succeed. They don't want to just sell us software exactly. or sell us a product. And I can tell you as a storytelling keynote speaker, that is so important. When I will say to an event planner or a VP of sales who's interviewing me versus two other people they're considering, and I say, let's imagine it's a week after the event. What would have to happen for you to feel like this was a home run? Mm. What would people be saying in the audience F a week later? Um, would they be taking a lot of notes? Would they be saying that's one of the best talks I've ever heard? Would they be starting to craft stories and close more sales? And then I say, you know, if that's the case, then why don't I also do a 30 and a 90 day one hour Zoom follow up after the event? Boom. Very few speakers offer that. Many clients have said to me, that's why we picked you. We wanted the impact to go on past the event annual sales meeting. Well, it's a, it's such a great idea. And it actually, I, I think, who is it? I think it's a guy by the name of Dr. Nick Morgan, Dr. Nick Morgan. If you, if you research some of that, he talks about one of the things we're always trying to assess is someone else's intent. Mm -hmm you know, is John's intent to help John or is John's intent to help Mark? Right. You know, and, and it's, and we're always on the lookout. If you come back with that approach above and beyond saying, Hey, let's assess this to make sure we've hit those metrics and our objective is going to be to make sure that's going to happen. I think if, I think if the, the buyer feels your intent is really to help them, that's how you stand out. That really is how we stand out. So, so gang, most of what we've been talking about so far, of course, has been better selling through storytelling. Great book, John Live, uh, Livesay, fantastic book. But I'm also looking at his latest book, the lovely title right behind his, his Zoom call here today, The Sale is in the Tale. Tell us a little bit about this book at a high level to get everybody interested, sure. John. What prompted the writing of this one and, and what's different in this one? Well, first of all, it's a business fable. So oh, it's a, it's a story about storytelling set here in Austin, where I've been living the last two years. So it's also a little bit of a love letter to Austin. Oh, nice. And it takes people on a journey of a salesperson's frustrations of hitting a you know, slump in their career and the lessons they learn from someone else they work with about storytelling and seeing it start to make things better and then having some more challenges. And as they go through the story, so you're learning about storytelling through right, while being immersed in the story. And then at the end is all the methodology spelled out on all the different kinds of stories and how to tell them. So people are loving it. I'm getting all kinds of um, uh, feedback like, oh, I was hoping, we're wondering if Ben and Sue were gonna get together at the end and all these other mm. things are really involved in the story, <laughs> uh, which is wonderful. And, uh, you know, something new that's in this book that was not in the other one is this concept of how do we get more resilient faster, right? We're all going to get rejected. We're going to get frustrated, disappointed, discouraged. And I've come up with something I call five, five, five. Mm. So somebody cuts you off in traffic, you go, fine, whatever. Some people lose their mind. I don't know, maybe not in Canada, 
but <laughs> for sure in Canada. Okay. For sure in Canada. We're not that nice. Uh, yeah. And you know, I'm like, well, ask yourself, pretend you're the movie director of your own life and say, will this matter in five minutes? Right. It's up to me. All right. How about five hours from now? For heaven's sakes, I sure hope not. And let's assume now we got a big no, we got a rejection. We didn't get a sale, whatever. Um, how about five days from now? And there's all this research that the faster you get back up, the more resilient and the more present you are. A lot of people hold on to those no's and that anger way too long so that when the next opportunity comes, they still have all that negative energy in their head and they keep talking about it with friends. I can't believe that person said that to me, blah, blah, blah. And um, now a lot of things in life, because you know I try to impact people's lives, not just their careers, um, is big. Like when my dad died eight years ago, I I'm wish sorry. I had this tool. Thank you. Because um, I said, okay, so five days from now, five, yeah, I'm still going to be upset. Okay, mm -hmm. how about five weeks, five months, five years from now? You keep zooming out in the fives. Well, five years from now, I could say to my younger self, you're still going to miss him, but I promise you, you won't be this sad. Right. And that would have helped so much. So now people are emailing me from reading the book or hearing me talk about this and say, Oh my gosh, I just five five this something that normally would be stressing me out for weeks. Thank you so much. And it's an easy thing to remember. It's an easy thing to start using. And it's a great tool to bring to the culture of, all right, gang, let's five 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 this. Let's not spend any more energy or time on it. Let's move on as a group because we need to hit the reset button. And we, we okay, we want to talk about this for five hours. Okay, and then we're going to be done, right? <laughs> right. So, yeah. Well, well, it's. Um, I was watching uh, late last night something called All or Nothing on mm. Netflix, and it spent a year traveling around with the Michigan Wolverines football team. Mm -hmm. It's a documentary, fantastic, love it. And in in the episode I saw last night, what happens? They 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 were undefeated. Then they play mm -hmm. a game, three interceptions in two quarters. And what happens, you see the quarterback obviously devastated. They're gonna, they're on their way to losing this game. It's back in 2016. Mm -hmm. And and then they cut to an interview with him. And and you know, he said, Listen, I'm in the middle of a game. I've just thrown three interceptions. I have to have a short memory. Mm. Because if I want to sit and feel bad about those interceptions, I've got another quarter of football to play. I always yeah. try and avoid too many hockey analogies here because it was a long time ago. But as a goalie in hockey, same thing. You will let in a bad goal uh -huh. no matter who you are. It's going to yeah. happen. Might be in front of 300 people, might be in front of 3,000 people. Yeah. And you're going to be both angry and embarrassed when that happens. But you're they're going to take another shot in about 13 seconds. Yeah. So, <laughs> so you better clear your head and yes. worry about the next shot. And, and so I think that's a, that's very good um, coaching not to, and for the managers, sales managers out there, I think this is a good one to remember. Not everyone breaks a goalie stick when a bad goal goes in, but they still feel terrible. Internalize it. Yeah. And so when you're managing your team and the big deal at the end of the quarter doesn't come in and you're feeling bad because you've committed that deal as a sales leader, yeah. you have to realize that some folks, even though they're not overtly showing anger, they're really having a tough time on the inside. So empathy, huge mm -hmm. yes. in terms of working with your team. So you don't make somebody feel even worse. Right. Well, Michael Phelps, everyone just assumes he won every race with a gold medal. Not true. Mm. I remember watching him, I'm a former swimmer. So I was, avid and still am fan of his and um you know he had so many races in a short amount of time within the same day sometimes um i'm like how there's not any rest between these races sometimes and he would come in second or third and he had to let that go to win the gold the next time and did his coach beat him up for coming in second or third probably not go check it off focus on what's in here be in the moment you know, is it such good coaching, John, because I mean, you're talking about also working with teams to help their self-esteem. Mm. And I, I think there's a real opportunity at the sales leadership role across the board to help with this as well. Yeah. And where, where we help manage the up and down of someone who's in professional sales, yeah. there's expectations, there's accountability, but there needs to be that psychological safety 
And I really think the more you know your team, yeah. you may know that, hey, John needs a bit of a tougher hit and Mark needs a bit of a softer hand, mm -hmm. you know, how, whatever works for that individual, but it's not it's not a single approach across the board because I think our mental health is so critically important in this business discipline. Well, instead of ABC, the old always be closing, I have an, an acronym I tell people ABK and I have them write it down on a post-it note, put it by their computer, their car, always be kind. Nice. Starting with the internal dialogue because how can you give out kindness if you're not kind to yourself? Yeah, I'm it's hard. Dude, right? You start beating yourself up just because you make a mistake doesn't mean you're a stupid or worthless person right so the kindness and then it goes to the teamwork and then the clients but man if you're at the core an angry bitter judgmental person inside your head and you're kind of doing that to other people that you work with there's no way you're going to be kind to clients right you're right it just, it just won't happen you'll they be 10 it. it'll it'll be inauthentic and so people go okay i want to i want to shift no matter what happens instead of, and nobody wants to be pushy and nobody wants to be pushed. So, but if I come in with a mindset of ABK in the, every situation to myself and others, man, that totally changes the energy, which goes back to that's how people buy is emotional energy. I like that ABK. I like that. Hey team. So we've been talking with John Livesay. He's known as the pitch whisperer. Mm -hmm. And today's topic has been so critically important because storytelling. It's a way to make yourself memorable, way to make yourself magnetic. John's got a very simple but powerful framework, four-step process for helping become more memorable through effective storytelling, exposition, identify the problem, of course, provide the solution, but then speak to the resolution. Mm -hmm. A couple of great reads. We'll bring John back to talk a little more about the sale is in the tale. But for now, everybody's going to go away and buy better selling through storytelling. There's nothing you've heard today that isn't so inherently logical. Of course, this would help us with our core messaging. By the way, not just for pitching when we're in a beauty contest, for our messaging on our website, for our yes. case stories instead of case studies, case yes. stories. Love that, John. Thank you. So, so John, when someone wants to bring you in for a keynote to speak mm -hmm. to their sales organization or learn more about how you help companies with this, how are they going to learn more about you today? The easiest thing is to just go to my website, johnlivesay.com, L-I-V as in Victor, E-S-A-Y. But if you can't remember the title of my books or my name, just Google The Pitch Whisperer and all my content shows up. I've trademarked that. And that's an easy thing to remember to find me and um, my speaking manager would be happy to talk to you about what your needs are. And then if that's a fit, then we have another in-depth conversation about, I really customize every single talk and interview the team and the audience and the clients to make it really impactful. Well, and also folks, thank you, John, by the way. And also check out John's podcast. It's John, correct me if I'm wrong. It's called The Successful Pitch. It is indeed. Okay, so some spectacular guests on The Successful Pitch podcast. That's a leading sales podcast and, and communication podcast. And team, first of all, I would love to thank our guest today, John Levesse. It's just been such a pleasure meeting you, John. Likewise. Thank you for your time and, and, and what you've given our audience here today. I'm sure everybody's going to take a lot from it. Great. And team, thank you very much for listening. So you all know that the reason we run the Selling Well podcast is to try and help improve the performance and professionalism of salespeople and improve the lives of salespeople. Our goal with this podcast is to share some strategies and processes and tools that you can apply to you and your business today. Today's podcast, a great example of that. <laughs> Now, we do want to continually improve, and we know you can help us. So if you're listening to the podcast today and you enjoyed it, fantastic. Please like and subscribe. If you're listening to this and you think there's other ways that we can provide value, we love constructive criticism. And my personal email that I check is called markcox at inthefunnel.com. Markcox at inthefunnel.com. We're tough. Give us your constructive criticism 
and we'll apply it to continually make this podcast more effective for you. And thanks to everybody for listening today.